I had thought we were going to have an awful lot more children in the audience today, so we are going to have to channel our inner child for this talk, okay? So I have had the good fortune of working with the world's most fascinating mammals really for the past 20 years. And today we're talking about light, but we're going to talk about what happens if you evolve to exist in the absence of light. And what does that do to your sensory perception? And this is a great big old fellow, and bats, the Latin name for the order is hand wing. And if you look at this large fruit bat here, you can see the length of his fingers and his thumbs. So essentially, they're rather like us, with huge, huge, huge hands, with a wing membrane across the hands, and this allows them to fly. But if you look at this, it's a Placotus auretus, or a long-eared bat. This is one of my favourite of all our species, and we find them here in Ireland. And bats have evolved to be able to exist and do very well in complete darkness. And with that, when you look at this, you can see very large ears. It's a long-eared bat. We're not that ingenious when we come up with names. But bats are quite a successful group. One-fifth of all living mammals today are bats. Bats as we know them, so a modern bat, was found in the fossil record about 55 million years ago. Beautiful, intact fossils showing that this fossil mammal had wings, had the appropriate cochlea to be able to hear sound like they do. So they've been around for a long time. Bats are the only mammals that have achieved true self-powered flight. And that itself is quite a difficult locomotive way of getting around. Think about times flight has evolved within the planet really ever. Not that many times. Most things walk or swim. Not that many different species fly. Again, we've about 1,200 species of bats. The smallest mammal in the world, it's a bat, not a shrew. Don't believe the shrew biologists. This is him. This is Crassonictus tonglongii. So very, 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 very small, called a bumblebee bat. So it's a mammal about the size of a bumblebee. But then you have the much larger fruit bats with these huge, big wingspans. So they have a range in size. But again, bats are nocturnal. It means they come out at night, they've evolved to live in complete darkness. Now, if you were children, you usually laugh at this. So we have to laugh here. So if you look at these two different species at these pictures, one of them is a nocturnal primate, the other one is a nocturnal bat. What senses do you think are most important for the bat? Just looking at it. Hearing. What about for the primate? Eyes. Now, we're primates, and we rely on our eyes to be able to perceive light to get information about our environment so that we can survive, essentially. And we find it difficult to really think that there's a lot of information in sound. So what we're going to do is we're all going to pretend to be bats. That means you have to close your eyes. And I'm going to show you how important sound is, that you can use sound to get a lot of information. I promise I won't do anything. Though. I'm going to go shout, so bats use echolocation. They make a sound and they hear the returning echo. We can all be a bat. So everybody, what we're going to do is I want you using sound alone to locate the prey. Now I'm going to make the sound and then you have to hear the returning echo. And I want you to turn and point where this prey is, okay? So everybody, close your eyes. It's a big test. See, children love this. Close your eyes. I'm going to say, Marco. Marco! Polo. Marco! Polo. Did you all? Who's, have everybody pointing in the right direction? We only have one person pointing. We're going to have a bunch of very hungry bats today. So there you go. So there is, there's information in sound. We have two ears so you can hear in stereo. So you can work out the location of something. Think about if you drop your keys on a tin plate or you drop your keys on a couch. There's a difference in the returning echo. So you can work out the texture of the object you bounce your, your sound off of. Bats do this really, really well. You can't really fool them. So we do a lot of experiments where you will have something that looks like an insect on a leaf, except it's not. It's a plastic mold. And the bats will fly up using sound, complete darkness, and avoid it totally. So there's, a lot of, there's information in sound that we probably can't really understand. And indeed, when scientists first work out that bats were actually using sound to get around at night in complete darkness. So in Italy, Spallanzi, in the late 1700s, took bats from a roost and he blinded the bats. Hot poker, not very nice. Blinded bats. 
But these bats, once they recovered from the procedure, they were released and they flew back to the roofs with big bellies full of insects. So being blinded didn't seem to affect them. So you go, oh, well, vision might not be important for them. Took individuals from the same colony. He then put wax in their ears, so he deafened them. The bats couldn't orient at all. They couldn't move around. So it sounds important. Took again, proper scientific experiment. Took another group, put little grommets in the wax, released them, they were perfectly fine. So he came up with the hypothesis, yes, bats are indeed using sound to get around. However, scientists, and really humans, we don't like paradigm shifts. Again, we're visual species. We use light. We need light to be able to understand our environment. Things that can use sound to perceive their environment, oh, they're strange. And indeed, George Cuvier said that if we suppose that bats hear or see with their ears, should we expect them also to hear with their eyes? And they laughed at the results, even though there it was, bats are using sound. And it wasn't really until uh, 1938 when Donald Griffin and Harvard had a ultrasound detector, so essentially turning the sound from the inaudible into the audible, by chance was in a room with bats flying around, opening their mouths, so, oh, there's a peak on my, uh, bat, my ultrasound detector, that they realized, yes, indeed, bats were using sound. And now it's commonplace. But how do they do it? So this is, I'm going to show you a, a, a movie that was done by researchers in Maryland. It's pretty cool. What they've done is they have gone and turned sound into a visual spectra for us. To, and they have a, they released a bat that's trained into a room with all of this soundproofing. They had uh, about 20 different uh, microphones. They worked out how were sound, bats using sound to find their prey. I will show you. So you see a flying bat up here. Dark is where the intensity of direction of the sound. Hear the crunch? <laughs> and essentially, so what bats do is when they, they emit sound, they're emitting a sound, 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 and an echo bounces back that is an insect, and they then go and they start emitting the sound more quickly, more quickly, more quickly, honing in and finding their prey. It's pretty cool. Now, when you're in the field as a bat biologist, you're able to identify bats based on their, the sound they make. Each species has its own unique signature of sound. They use something like this, which is a bat detector. Turns ultrasound into the audible. And here's one, this is Placotus auretus. So again, let's all imagine you're all now working in my lab, and this is what you hear when you go out. That's its particular sound. But then, you hear another noise. Play it again. Can you hear the difference? Mm -hmm. So really brilliant trained bat biologists can hear just from the sound alone what the different species of bats are. Now bats are wonderfully diverse. Again, one-fifth of all living mammals are bats and they exist in many different environments and niches. And these are pictures taken by uh, an ex-PhD student of mine who's now a professor in Germany just to show you some of the diversity of different types of bats. I think they're beautiful. But again, each one of them have evolved a different type of echolocation call, a different way of getting around in complete darkness. And typically, these calls, so this is where you see the frequency and the time, just to show you what the energy spectrum looks like. Typically, they make these calls are, well, you have one species of bat, one group of bats, these horseshoe bats. And these are the ones that have RF, that big, long, straight line. They're different. What they do is they separate their outgoing and their incoming echo in terms of frequency, and they use a Doppler shift, and they're able to emit their calls for a much longer time. So imagine in complete darkness, you go into a room, and you're able to just flash a torch once, and you, most bats will click, 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 click. So you get these little pieces of image. But with these horseshoe bats that are using this constant frequency echolocation, you can shine your light and look around. So they've evolved a different ability. Again, most bats feed on insects. Small eyes, large ears, feed on insects. But then you have a group of these. These are your old world fruit bats. There's about 190 species. 
they're different. They feed on fruit, they feed on nectar, they feed on pollen. They're really, really important for pollinating plants in the Neotropics or in the Old World. They're also really, really important for dispersing seeds. So they play a key role in our ecosystems. So within bats, 1,200 species, you have two different types. You have these fellows. So do you reckon vision is important for these guys? No, you can hardly see their eyes. Those little things are their nose leaf. The eyes are small and they have all hair over them. Whereas you look at him, very handsome. What do you think he looks like? Okay, good. This other group said a mouse once. I was like, not at all, just look like a mouse. They do, they're called flying foxes. They look like dogs. But again, they're also nocturnal. So two nocturnal species or groups from a single order of mammals. So I think, all right, I'm a comparative zoologist. And you've always heard the old phrase, as blind as a bat. And so I want to say, well, what's the effect of not having color, not having light? Think about color. Can you see color at dark? No. So always we wondered, well, will bats really blind or not? Well, how do you go and do this? How do you test to see what an organism can see? So if you remember some of the old experiments where they would study bees and they'd train them to land on different plates with sugar water and so forth, you can do these type of tests, behavioral experiments, but they're long and they're difficult. But I'm also a geneticist. And what you can also do now that we've got great advances in genetics, is you can go into the genome, amplify the region that you're interested in, and you can kind of see, do bats have the genes that code for the proteins to allow them to see? Yes or no? So here you would have it, and in the ones that have no eyes, these shouldn't work at all. The ones that have big, big eyes, they should be perfectly different for trying to perceive, get some light from dark. And so the one thing is really nice working with vision genes, and one particular type of vision genes are your opsin genes. And these are the genes that are found in the cones in your retina that allow you to perceive color. So light within the short, medium, and long wavelengths. And they are, again, proteins found inside your cone cells that get excited by a particular wavelength of light. If it doesn't work, what happens is you will not be able to see that particular light. So we went decided to sequence this a whole bunch of bats. Went out, caught particular types of bats, took a little bit of a wing punch, caught them from all around the world, things bats I could see well, bats I could not see so well. Went into the lab upstairs, amplified the region, lined it all up, looked to see whether that gene was actually functional. Because if you don't need something, you lose it. Think of your tail. And what we found, very interestingly, I thought they weren't going to have any functional ones, that the majority of bats have functional cone opsins, and that these opsins are able to get excited by ultraviolet light. That was amazing. So bats can see in the ultraviolet. And it's highly, highly conserved of evolutionary time, so it's very important for them to survive ultraviolet. The question is why? Interestingly enough, Bats that could use an advanced type of echolocation, the high duty cycle echolocation, shining your torch for a long time, it didn't work. It was non-functional. They couldn't see in those wavelengths of light. So sound was more important for these species. Even more interesting, and I still don't understand why. If you were one of those fruit bats, but you lived in a cave, so again, you were using vision and smell to get around at night, feeding on fruit, UV vision is not important for you either because that gene doesn't work. So the question is, what's going on? And very briefly, why should we care? So these are eyes taken from all different parts of life. So you have insect eyes and spider eyes, horrible one up there, bat eyes and so forth. Why should we care what diversity, how different species have evolved, different abilities to deal with perceiving their environment? Again, I'm a comparative geneticist. And what you can do is you can go in and you can target genes and proteins that we know if you have a defect in it, you're going to be blind. So we have a certain amount of information by studying human families, people who are blind, people who are not blind, and looking at the difference in certain genes. But we don't really understand how it's all working yet. We don't really understand our genome. And really, it's only by looking at how these genes have evolved and things that see a certain way and things that don't see a certain way or have lost this ability 
that we can actually go, nature has done these experiments for us. We can work out which parts of our genes are important for vision. You can put anything else you want in there. It could be vision, it can be cancer, it can be so forth. This is comparative genomics. Final plug, the other cool thing I didn't get a chance to talk about, why these species are so unbelievably amazing. It probably has to do with them evolving flight and being nocturnal. They also have evolved an ability to somehow defy the aging process. And we're working on that. I want to say thank you all for coming on a beautiful sunny Saturday. And again, thanks to all my research group who make this happen. Right now, each one of us are pretending to be a particular species of bat. <laughs> and had there been more children here, you guys are the future. So think about these ideas. And I don't think we have time for questions. But again, I'll be around later on. So thanks. <laughs>